now continue with video two of part three, the Nephilim problem, then the Elohim. The comparison to the red-haired cone heads is the most interesting now for Toby Singer to answer. Why? This gets back to Genesis 3.15, which is matrilineal based on mitochondrial DNA unto salvation. Tovia has to explain why the angels took women and begotten from the daughters of men were Nephilim giants, men of renown, and they were not virgin birth. And Hashem said they were only evil continually. Genesis 6 and the Benni Elohim. There's a link. For verily David slew the giant. And this would mean that the Davidic throne had to be via what Isaiah 9, 6 to 7 states, which is unto a child is born, a son is given, who was also known as everlasting father. And then to retain the likeness of sinful flesh. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7 could be said to be the theological fusion point for salvational, entirely based on Genesis 3, 15. And then cometh the monogenes theos, entering humanity, the Alpha and the Omega. Considering the fact that Tovia could use the traditional teaching of the Seth line, eventually intermarrying with the line of Cain, it is beyond reason how these two men, Seth and Cain, being human, could develop giants, along with having six fingers and toes. And interestingly, I just recently talking with an individual who knew of someone who went into a, a room and there was this really, really, really tall woman. And lo and behold, she had six toes. Unless sin caused a genetic anomaly when the two strains of humanity intermarried. <clears throat> but that anomaly is not convincing and one would much rather believe the Bible authority. That it was the matter of the fallen angels tinkered with male sperm at the Beni Elohim level, inseminated and procreated a monstrosity. The men of renown, albeit or perhaps bypassed male sperm, and managed to somehow introduce their own blueprint which might not be called DNA into human women. Tovi has clearly the Nephilim problem since Benny Elohim are now introduced into the human genome. There's a link for that. Six fingered Bigfoot petroglyph in Utah. What is to be noted is Lucifer created a male or paternal based conception program to procreation of the giants of pre-flood and then the red head giants after the flood defying the more difficult maternal conception of the monogenes theos, the uniquely begotten God. John 1.18. In other words, Tovi uses the patrilineal reasoning with Daniel 7.13, missing the point, one like the Son of Man who is received by the Ancient of Days, must be a matrilineal concept because of Genesis 3.15. Mitochondrial DNA is the circular chromosome found inside the cellular organelles called mitochondria located in the cytoplasm, mitochondria, 
are the site of the cell's energy production and other metabolic functions. Offspring inherit mitochondria, and as a result, mitochondrial DNA from their mother. There's your link. From their mother equals as a 9 6 in Genesis 3 15. Hello? Heaven's intervention. The thing is that Rabbi J's are denying the intervention in heaven and from heaven on planet Earth in reference to the sin problem and the one who comes from the heavens as in days of old. The matter of Genesis 6. The matter of Genesis 6 brings in what is contrary to Genesis 3.15. And Tovia would have to explain why the angels did this and for what reasons. The reasons appear to be the corruption of the human genome with foreign DNA as well as impeding by corruption. The genetic line of Genesis 3.15 during the flood, and this would account why Noah was perfect in his generations. Whereas the traditional explanation leaves out this matter of Satan creating giants in his own image, since in the traditional view, it is still two races of humans, and it would simply be moral corruption unless Satan also did his alterations by way of the traditional church belief. And that is possible as well, since he did it with Canaanites who were still human. Tovia's patrilineal emphasis. Tovia's patrilineal emphasis of Daniel 7.13 is a basic and serious error. Why? Since to them, Rabbi J, Satan helps God in the Old Testament as a sort of servant who, do, to do, who does God's bidding. So in order to bypass the responsibility of analyzing the implications of Genesis 6, a patriarchal intervention, Tovia would have to explain the matter of image and likeness in relation to the matter of Mount Hermon and the 200 angels that descended, as well as the implications of the Paracas skulls, as well as the Indian legends of the cannibalistic giants in Death Valley. And here and here, here's all your sources, here's all your proof, and the Anasazi apocalypse, as well as the chronicles of... A Catholic priest speaking of the giants, practicing gay rituals, and that a lightning bolt from heaven cut them down. Mount Hermon is a contradiction of the transfiguration. Both involve sonship. Both involve Genesis 3.15 and Genesis 6. Mount Hermon, though not in the Bible, is synonymous with Genesis 6. This means he who made order to wipe out the Rephaim and all the other giant races was the real meaning of the Old Testament. Paracas skull notes. Concerning the Paracas skulls, this is where the work of Brian Forrester comes in. And you can see the YouTube video here. Because the, of the Paracas skulls, is a phenomenon far removed from the mainstream belief of the Genesis account of the Sethites intermarriage with the line of Cain, yet still in line with the Genesis 6 anomaly. The Paracas introduces the Sidonians by way of the red hair gene, which was traced to Lebanon. Ezekiel 28 presents a race of people who were the epitome of satanic intelligence and malice, as well as portraying a transhuman element. This is the reason for the Greek myths of Neptune and Poseidon, the latter which presents the mythology of the king of the seas, prophetic motif, along with etymology <coughs> of the name which links the matter of identification to the Sidonians. That the Sidonians operated in the Mediterranean Sea is that this may have brought forth the legends of Atlantis. 
Yet there appears to be a much older Atlantis since the area of Cuba and the Bimini wall shows that there was an ancient civilization buried underneath the ocean, very close to Cuba, along with so-called sightings of glass pyramids underneath the ocean. This Atlantis appears to have been sunken with the rise of the post-Ice Age waters in the eastern Atlantic. Conclusion. The Beni Elohim patrilineal concept of the Nephilim Raphaim giants takes Tobia to the place of theological internment and utter difficulty. The patrilineal concept cannot be applied to Daniel 7.13, which is Tobia's comfort response, because, as has been shown, Genesis 3.15 reveals the mitochondrial is of the woman's seed. This aspect of Daniel 7.13 is on another level and beyond the scope of Tobia to explain. Without applying continual damage, to the Hebrew Bible, Alpha and Omega in the Old Testament. Is there a reference to the Alpha and Omega of Revelation 22, 13 and 16 to be found referred in the Old Testament? Or is it something special that only emerges after the offspring of David scenario? Yes, the Old Testament does confirm the Alpha and the Omega. Zechariah 3. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men that are a sign. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. For I, behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua, upon one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith Yahweh of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. The Old Testament reference to the seven eyes, Zechariah 3 9, equals Revelation chapter 4's seven spirits before the throne of God, which equals Alpha and I will remove, is himself in the Omega scenario as the perfect sacrifice. It's either, it's eternal, father number two speaking in the alpha scenario and his sending himself in the slave form of human genetics, which equals the branch. Alos overshadowed Mary to prove by the matrilineal empirical law of DNA is the basis of Genesis 3.15. Further, Malachi 3 is very specific. The messenger of the covenant will arrive at his temple. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Matthew 21. It is the covenant in Zechariah 9.11, which says, as for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit, wherein is no water. Zechariah, addressing the king of Israel, comes riding on the donkey. The, ones, the one having salvation in Zechariah 9.9. There's only one such king written about, associated with the temple. Salvation and a covenant for the people. Messiah. Christ is the messenger of the covenant. Psalms 110. Tovia's idolatry argument. So have a look at this. Tovi responds in this video that Psalms 110, 1 to 4 is an idolatry argument. So Psalms 110 
in context means David would have to be of the order of Melchizedek. Are you laughing? And that David had no father or mother or beginning of days nor end of life. Fact is that 11Q13 destroys Tovia's argument and references the ancient understanding of Melchizedek as deity. 11Q13 stands as witness against him, as does Michael, Daniel 12.1, standing up from his place of authority as arbiter of the resurrection. It is also being said that David was of the order of Melchizedek. The problem is that the order of Melchizedek is comprised of Alpha and Omega, and David was only a part of the Omega. Wonderful number. The angel with an ego? So why is this angel talking about his name being wonderful and secret? Why is he telling Manoah this, since it's pointing to the greatness of the angel? The angelic figure is describing glory to himself, unlike the angel in Revelation 22, who tells John to worship he who made. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then said he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. I think that was pretty clear. Judges 13. So why is this angel talking about his name being wonderful and secret in Judges 13? Why is he telling Manoah this since it's pointing to the greatness of the angel? Tovi needs to analyze this matter of Judges 13 because the angelic figure is ascribing glory to himself, unlike, as you just read, the angel in Revelation who tells John to worship he who made. Name, it is wonderful. It says, And the angel of Yahweh said unto him, Wherefore asketh thou after my name, seeing it is wonderful? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? In two different versions. And Young's, and the messenger of Yahweh said to him, Why is this thou dost ask for my name, and it is wonderful? And the Malak Hashem said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my Shem, saying it is Phoebe, supremely wonderful? See Isaiah 9, 5, Exodus 15, 11. Orthodox Jewish version. But the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask after my name, saying it is wonderful, miraculous? And he answered him, Why askest thou my name, which is wonderful? Further references can be found here. There's more. 11Q13. Who were the writers of these ancient texts? Hebrews. Descendants of the house of Japheth? This Hebrew cultural evidence brings back the two powers or two divines as a valid thesis and proof of John 1.1. Unfortunately, Tovi is very vague on the matter of Psalms 110. Whether Hashem said to Adonai is from greater to lesser, it still points to two individuals, and this second Lord cannot be King David. From Tovia's inaccurate perspective, the fact is, it's the Omega scenario. But from the way Jesus presented it, it's the Alpha scenario. David did not fulfill verses 1 to 4. Then one can see it from the perspective of Zechariah 3, 7 to 9. It says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts. I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. 
Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee. For there men wondered at. Behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. The angel of the Lord is the heavenly form and the branch Messiah. David's Lord is the slave form. But ultimately, it's Father in heaven who speaks to the word. Yet in Zechariah 3, 7 and 9, the angel of the Lord is speaking with the authority of sending the branch Messiah. Compare Zechariah 3 with Revelation 1, which says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Conclusion. An angel, whose name is Wonderful, is David's Lord in Psalms 110, that delineates, delineates two powers. And also Daniel 7.13, and has been explained, validates the deity of Melchizedek, that defines the order of Melchizedek. The Lord of hosts, the branch, ordered the destruction of the Rephaim, the Beni Elohim. The maternal line of Genesis 3 can never be scientifically violated. And to do so, one denies salvation and healing. The one who was cut off in the midst of the week in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And with that, part four is the following. I hope this helps. Stay tuned for that. God bless.